In 2017, I was invited to be a part of an ethics panel at the 6th Annual Animal Law Symposium held at the University of North Carolina School of Law. With me on this panel were Dr. Jennifer Campbell from North Carolina State University and Mr. Ryan Marquis from the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. This is a great conference, so if you ever have the opportunity to attend, you should definitely try. At the time that I presented at this conference, I was the Director of Simulation for the UNC School of Medicine. But what is simulation? Simulation is a technique. It's not a technology. Quite often, discussions of simulation really focus heavily on what we're using to teach, not the methods at which we're actually trying to accomplish that education to reach our objectives. Greater than 70% of medical errors have some type of communication component included. So it becomes a lot more important for us to focus our time and energy on different types of communication techniques, which might include huddling before we get started, how we hand over information and, and, and discuss things as we go through, and then also looking really intently at what happens afterwards in the debriefing. Standardized patients and confederates are taking a person and kind of embedding them in the team, whether they be the patient themselves that are trained to respond in certain ways, or they can be team members that are embedded into the situation to elicit the response that we need to reach our objectives. We can use task trainers like the one you see here for inserting central lines where you have this fake chest, um, or it could be the medical equipment itself that the, the clinicians need to learn how to use. The mannequin-based trainers are generally what most people seem to think of when I ask them what they think of medical simulation. In the top left corner, you can see the picture of the anesthesia residents all working together as a team with some confederates around the mannequin. In the bottom right, the mannequin there can actually give birth. In this particular session, they were working on fetal monitoring. One of my favorite techniques is using serious games and virtual environments to allow the learners to get together in, in groups and go through a lot of very similar experiences and they can get a whole lot more training done in a very short period of time if the conditions are right. Each of these different techniques that we've already discussed really come down to giving us an opportunity to do repetitive practice, some active learning, and create those really powerful opportunities for reflection because the reflection period is really where most of the learning occurs. Only recently have we really accepted that simulation really is a great way to learn and this is one of those things that we should be doing more and more of and we don't actually publish too many papers anymore showing the validity. Now it's more about how can we improve our uh, return on investment, how can we improve the way people are interacting, and what are the takeaways that they're getting in the learning. The nursing community has done some really truly exceptional work looking at how much simulation time can replicate and replace actual clinical time towards learning and ultimately certification. Now, all of these techniques that we've just talked about are things that can be done without harming or even including any animals um, at all. But what fun would this be if we didn't actually expand a little bit? So now I'm going to ask you guys some questions and kind of offer a few different perspectives that may be a little controversial, but I don't know that there's any clear answers to. But I do think that it's worth us discussing um, for the sake of this ethics panel. Since we are here in the law school, it seems fitting that we have this opportunity to treat me as a hostile witness. This picture actually is one of our simulations that we do with the School of Medicine, School of Pharmacy, and uh, the School of Nursing, and I'm actually playing a father here uh, giving my testimony. While the rubber arms seen here in the top left are great for learning the order in which to use the different things to do with blood draw, nothing is quite the same as actually sticking a real person like you see the training down here in the bottom right. The struggle to keep a mannequin alive is just not the same as trying to struggle to keep a person or, uh, as we previously trained in, in many years, uh, keeping an animal alive. An empathy gap has even been described, especially in procedurally based specialties. Um, and the question I have there is, do you think this is related to the fact that people aren't seeing something that's alive earlier in medical schools or in their medical training where they actually have to do something to something that is alive. In some areas of medicine, we've made great strides to do safer procedures by not having to fully open the body up. The problem is that when the bad stuff starts to go down in an OR and the patient has to be opened up to, to change over to this open type or procedure from a laparoscopic, 
the surgeons aren't getting as much practice as they used to because we're not doing that is animal training one way to actually bridge that that knowledge gap that we're creating by having better medicine i can definitely say that i don't have any answers to the questions that i just presented i do think there's a lot of opportunities that lie ahead for us in the technological um, realm as well as in just improving our general techniques please give this video a thumbs up and comment below and let me know what you think about the use of animals and the continued decrease in the use of animals that we have in the medical education field see you next week